the planet Earth. Some call me nature. I am very passionate about the planet Earth. A living, breathing planet capable of sustaining whatever life forms we see fit to deposit on it. Spock, judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived. It's the planet stupid. No, no, no. It's the planet stupid. Planet stupid is Belinda Weymouth, eco journalist. Usually has some good news along with the bad. So, hi, Belinda. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I have a little bit of everything today. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. Just the way you said it, it was funny. Yeah. Uh, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Well, why don't we start off with the not so great news, and then we'll get to the good news because I think to end on a high note is I think that our audience will like that. Oh. Uh, and you will too, Mark. It'll put you in a good mood. So oh, come on. Oh, that'll be good. Uh, that's yeah, a heavy yeah, yeah. lift. So that's, yeah, let's yeah. Go no, no. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm up for the challenge. Okay. So here's the thing. We've got this terrible coral bleaching event happening right now. You know, we've talked before on the show that global ocean temperatures are out of control. I mean, they're super. You know, they're one to degree, one to two degrees Celsius above. Um, uh, you know, background levels of back in the 1980s. There's a visual in one of the uh, links that I sent you guys. Uh, and then in some parts of the world, they're up three degrees Celsius. And that is really, really huge. And it's a huge, um, I mean, it's terrible for uh, corals in particular, because uh, that's how we get coral bleaching. And just to sort of go over, you know, look, that the ocean is doing us a massive solid. You know, it's seventy-one percent of the ocean. I mean, of the you know the the whole planet is uh, the ocean. You know, it's only twenty-nine percent terrestrial, and it has sucked up thirty percent of our greenhouse gases, but ninety percent of the heat. And water has a really high heat capacity, which means it takes a lot to heat it up. Which you can imagine because look how big and huge the oceans are and how deep they are. So all this heat is going into them. Um, and then what happens to the corals is the corals have this symbiotic relationship with this lovely little algae called, I love the name, zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae live in the corals. They give it its color and they also um, uh, metabolize food that the coral then survives on. So what happens is when the when the coral gets hot, it expels the zooxanthellae. Out they go. And right now, 40, no, 54 percent of the world's corals are in heat distress and are bleaching. And it's going up by 1% every week. Coral, you know, uh, and marine biologists and coral specialists, they are taking corals out of the water in Florida to try and save them. It's it's really unbelievable. And the last, we've had four major bleaching uh, events since 1980. And the two uh, big ones recently have been in the last decade. And the one that's happening now, they think will surpass just in a few weeks because the last time uh, in 2014, 2017, it was 56% of corals the world over. Uh, and, you know, this is this is just, it's not okay. I mean, I, I actually just tweeted you a story that I wrote about the coral triangle, you know, quite a while ago, just because most people haven't heard of it. And it's a this massive uh, coral triangle uh, around Indonesia and uh, at the northern part of Australia and Malaysia. I mean, a tenth of the world's reef species, or no, no, actually more than that, live in this, you know, one, you know, coral area. And they're the juvenile um, sort of... Uh, where juvenile fish go to mature a, a coral reef. So yes, on the left, you see a healthy coral reef. It has its zooxanthellae, it has this beautiful color. And on the right, it's bleached, it's expelled the zooxanthellae. It can survive for a while, while it's hot without the zooxanthellae, but eventually it will um, starve. And then you'll get those horrible, you know, the brown, you know, yucky looking coral that has just died, right? You know, when it's, it, there's a period where, you know, sort of a grace period, I suppose you'd call it. But it's a real wake up call. And what scientists are so nervous about is will the La Nina that's taking over from this El Nino. El Nino heats the oceans up, particularly the Pacific. But right now we're seeing the heating in the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean. It's everywhere. Um, and, you know, will the La Nina be able to take that heating down? We just we don't know. And because it has this high heat capacity, it holds on to the heat. You know how the ocean sort of stays at the same temperature? The land has a low heat capacity, so it heats up during the day. And as soon as the sun goes, you know, the earth gets quite cold. But the ocean is very steady. Um, 
so you know uh, right. is help on the way with la nina we they just don't know the effort to rebuild some of these dead coral reefs the idea somehow that you can um you can grow coral in a more controlled environment and then transplant it. I mean, I've seen some of this. I mean, it can't be done on a grand enough scale, I'm sure, to really make a huge difference. But is there something to that? Well, yeah. I mean, what they're doing is they're actually uh, relocating corals. They're taking them from the hot equatorial regions um, and taking them to colder parts of the ocean. But, uh, you know, yeah, how sustainable is that? And, and um you know, can we really do that when you think how enormous the ocean is, how big these coral reefs are and how difficult it must be, you know, to, you know, to move them? I mean, it's a it's a mammoth undertaking. Um, sure, sure. And, and, and the problem is, you know, we, we talk about this a lot is, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. You know, we live on the edges of the oceans. You know, there aren't a lot of us who are diving down, you know, with a tank on our backs and looking and seeing what's happening. And when you you know, hear and, you know, talk to these marine biologists who are, um, you know, trying to save these coral reefs. I mean, they're sort of losing their minds. They've never seen their coral reefs in such distress before. So, um, you know, there's that, there's this sort of psychological toll that's happening to the people, you know, the very people who are trying to save them. Uh, so the news is of concern. And I mean, I, I even think, I don't know the word stronger than concern when it comes to the heating of the ocean because you'll see the coral die and you'll see many species die. If the oceans, and they're already huge parts of the ocean that are inert, right, dead. I mean, there's a, there are big spots where there is no longer any life. Isn't that right? I, I talked to somebody who's a sea captain who told me that. Yeah, yeah, we have these horrible areas. Uh, yeah, we, we we do have dead zones. I mean, we have one at the end, you know, with a, a you know Mississippi River comes out into the you know Gulf of Mexico. I mean, all the nutrients that it brings down, all that fertilizer, you know, all the sewage, which is full of nitrogen. So what happens is you get a big algal bloom because it gets all the food. And then when the when the algae dies, it sucks all the oxygen out of the water as it's um, decomposing. And then there's no oxygen for the fish because how do fish and marine species get their oxygen? They get it just by swimming around and drinking the ocean water for the oxygen content. So yes, we've got these you know, dead zones happening. I mean, we also have, I mean, this is a thing that's in the article that I tweeted to you today, talking about marine protected areas and how important they are, and that we are getting, you know, more and more of those around the world. But we we really have to be curbing our emissions. You know, we the, the ocean is not, you know, the thing about the ocean is when, when the water gets hot enough, the CO2 it, you know, it, it's not, uh, you know, it, it can't be absorbed by the ocean. The ocean's actually expelling CO2 and oxygen because it's too uh, hot for those uh, gases to be, um, you know, to better dissolve into it. Um, so it, it's it's a real concern. And, um, you know, it's a real wake up call because it's also the weather, you know, and it's the thing we were talking before about, you know, the um, Atlantic meridial overturning circulation current, you know, the one that, you know, goes up the, you know, the eastern seaboard and, you know, up to, you know, Greenland and then goes down and, you know, all the way down to Antarctica and, you know, is taking nutrients and, you know, oxygen and, you know, all these things, and you know, and also, you know, um, the thermocline, it's also moving the heat around in the ocean. We don't want those currents to be disrupted because we've made the ocean too hot. And that's the thing that people, you know, you know, marine scientists are also very concerned about. Will we break down those ocean currents that our, um, you know, uh, I mean, I hate to get too dire, Mark, but you know, that our very survival. I mean, you know, we need those ocean currents to be working. Well, yeah, I mean, is... it is true that, you know, the ocean dies, we die. There's no question about it. And and it's all just such a delicate uh, balancing act. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. exactly. Uh, so what else can you tell us that's perhaps more encouraging? Okay, so here's <laughs> here's the stuff that's good. And this is so great. So we were talking last week about the, the uh, Swiss win that the 2,500 2, uh, grannies had, you know, where the 
uh, the European Court of Human Rights said, yes, you're absolutely right. Switzerland has not been taking care of you. And, and just so our listeners know, those women were working for nine years on their legal case. It took nine years to get their day in court and they got justice. But here's a thing that's amazing is this litigation is happening all over the world. And it's not just... Um, you know, governments and fossil fuel companies that are being taken to court. The one that I think is so great is also people are going, hey, we've really had it with these companies greenwashing and telling us that their products are, you know, eco-friendly, have this huge recycled content in them, you know, that they're carbon neutral. And what the courts are finding is that, you know, the plaintiffs are right. Because what's happened is, so we've got these young uh, you know, savvy consumers who really want eco, you know, friendly products. The the sale of eco friendly products has doubled, and so what's happened is all these corporations are making these ridiculous claims about their brand. You know, that sort of doubled. But the other thing that's doubled are the lawsuits against said brands for doing so. So there was this one. There was this Danish company that said that their pork was climate friendly. And they got taken to court and the court said, hey, enough. This is nonsense. This is, uh, you know, baloney you know, trying to say that, you're, you know, your your meat is um, uh, yeah, I'm using a meat pun there uh, is 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 uh, climate friendly because it's not. You can't say that, you know, it's climate friendlier than you thought. So that company has stopped saying that there was an Australian airline that was claiming that their airline travel was carbon neutral. Well, you, you can't plant enough trees to have carbon neutral, um, you know, air travel. Travel. KLM, uh, the Dutch airline, they now can't say that their flights are sustainable. You know, so you've, you've had all this sort of bogus, all these bogus claims. And the thing that's so great about this, and when we saw what happened last week, and we had, you know, our 16 young Montanans last year, you know, win against the state of Montana when they said, by not regulating uh, these, uh, you know, mining projects here, you are violating, you know, our, you know, health outcomes. Um, it, you know, what the people are saying is, you know, we're not going to take it anymore, which, you know, <laughs> fantastic. And it's having this real effect because, uh, you know, combining that with the science, it's changing the narrative, it's giving civil society agency it's putting corporations and governments on notice, which is really good. And these, you know, people are winning. And so when you, okay, so we've got the greenwashing, then we've got, you know, fossil fuels. So there was a an NGO uh, in the Netherlands, a Dutch NGO, that took Shell to court in 2015. It was the first case of saying, hey, you, you know, you're, you know, you're wrecking the planet. You're causing climate change. And Shell was ruled against and the high court in uh, the Netherlands said, OK, um, this government has to uh, reduce its carbon emissions below 1990 levels by 25 percent by the year 2020. And the thing that's sort of great there is that you have a judiciary that is you know, not partisan. And so even though a right wing you know, a party has taken power in the Netherlands, it cannot overturn uh, this, um, the, you know, governmental policy, which was put in place by this, by this uh, lawsuit, because there's a threshold that the government, whoever, you know, whatever party they are, has to reach a certain amount of climate mitigation, you know, every year. And I mean, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if we had, you know, <laughs> Uh, non-partisan judges here and we could rely on them to uphold you know these legal laws because as we can you know we're we're seeing their you know we they change as the government changes yeah i mean i uh, uh that's rid of the power of the courts to to modify and really uh recast a lot of environmental policy uh you know because these things have been going on for so long i mean toxic dumping's been going on for so long and it's interesting that we do have an agency in this country at the EPA, and they do have uh, some muscles to flex. But what's happening now, and I think probably regular listeners uh, to this show are sick of hearing me say it, but I just, I mean, I'm telling you, this train is coming down the tracks. 
they are going to be undermined completely by this Supreme Court, just as you've said. It's mm. a corporate-friendly court, and they are looking for ways to undermine the power of the EPA. And so they are going to uh, undermine that power both in the uh, way that they regulate toxic dumping and they regulate toxins in the environment, and they're going to go after consumer protections as well. But yeah, I love yeah. to see what you pointed out, which is that there are other parts of the world where that is not the case, where you are seeing the courts flex their muscles and they're saying, regardless of the party in power, this has to be taken care of. So yeah, I mean, yeah, it's no, it's it's really it's fantastic, and and of course Shell is you know appealing against that decision, but the NGO that was successful, I mean, it just absolutely emboldened them, or or it, not emboldened, I shouldn't say, it just sort of, that you know when they got that decision, and you know, and, and justice is on their side because this is about you know their survival, their children's survival, their grandchildren. You know, now they're going after five big banking institutions. They're going after all these different corporate multinationals. And, you know, it's really changing the narrative and giving, you know, like I said, civil society is being, you know, empowered by this. And then when those, you know, young, you know, that group of, you know, 16 young Montanans got that, you know, ruling in their favor, the rest, you know, you know, kids and other states sit up and go oh hey well if they can do that you know in montana you know we can do that here and 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 the thing is that the the world has been looking for this sort of transnational movement and what we're seeing is it's happening in the courts and it may not always be perfect you know columbia back in 2018 there was a ruling that uh, they had to stop the deforestation of the Amazon, you know, from the, you know, the Colombian, you know, edge of the Amazon. Well, that was in 2018 and it wasn't until 2022 when they did get a political party in power who believed that saving the Amazon was important, that that actually got enacted, you know. So, so it's not, you know, it's not a perfect um, thing. And there are, you know, you rule against these companies. I mean, I'll tell you what happens to a fossil fuel. As soon as there's a lawsuit against them, their stock prices go down. And if the plaintiffs are successful, their stock prices go down, you know, stock goes down even more. So, you know, it, this hits them where it hurts. And what um, there's a lot of analysis being done of these cases, because what they're finding is globally, not, you know, this excluding the US ones, you know, that 55% of these cases that are being brought are ending up being positive for the, you know, the climate. And so it's putting governments and corporations on notice. So they are actually being sort of forced to change their policy because they can see, you know, the, the people are, are showing their political will in court. I suppose is what it boils down to. No, that's exactly right. I mean, that's that states it so well because you have to, to you know, to bring the litigation, you must have people to bring it, and uh, and that's by the way for another time. One of the ways in which these big companies have challenged a lot of these lawsuits is who has agency for whatever grievance you have, an environmental grievance. In, in other words, mm. uh, who has who is affected, who is harmed. And so when you bring a case, you have to have agency. And that's one of the things. And of course, the environment doesn't have a voice. And so you need people to bring these cases. And yet, the way that they try to undercut the cases to go, well, you know, who are you guys? I mean, you're not, uh, you're not, you're not people who are affected, you're, you have no agency with this case. Um, but it is the only way, sadly, I think that you get corporate attention is with the bottom line, as you've said, and mm -hmm. those court yeah. cases do it because the stock yeah. is affected. All right, in our last minute or two, uh, tell me about the uh, crackdown on, uh, did we do greenwashing yet? I'm sorry. I'm, um, yeah, yeah, we did that in the beginning. We did. We I'm, I'm on litigation. so many painkillers, I can't even think. <laughs> oh, um, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I have, I hear uh, you don't yes. sound well. It's not the pain in my soul. It's uh, I've got a, I had mouth uh, oral surgery, so that's what's uh, affecting me a little bit. Um, so have we gotten to everything, Belinda? We kind of have. We've oh my all... God, that's yeah. extraordinary! I know, I know. I don't know it. what to say. What? Never been anything I, like this. I am really, <laughs> really impressed. Wow. Yeah. Well, I I am a fast talker. So <laughs> you are. You you brought and, it and you brought it. Uh, yeah, find well, Belinda Weymouth across social uh, media. And you find her here on Wednesdays. Belinda Weymouth. Weymouth is W-A-Y-M-O-U-T-H. Love hanging out with you. Thank you for being here. And that's It's the Planet Stupid for today. My pleasure. See you next week. 
more. It's the planet stupid. No, no, no. It's the planet stupid. Next time, only on the Mark Thompson Show. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped. And please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.